Hello everyone. Um, so my plan is to use the handout uh, that uh, the extended handout that's on Moodle um, to uh, use as a base uh, for uh, what will be, I guess, a sort of lecture uh, on the topic of the metaphysics of time. Um, so I'll, I'll basically talk through the handout, um, hopefully elaborate a bit, uh, especially on difficult points, um, in, in an effort to make them uh, clearer. Um, the the handout, uh, together with hopefully uh, this lecture um, and the readings uh, on the topics of the metaphysics of time, um, will... Uh, provide you with a, a solid grounding in the topic. So, uh, to, to, for the most part, we so far in this uh, um, sort of interrupted uh, course, we've uh, focused on um, space and uh, then latterly the nature of space-time, so uh, thinking about the relation of time to space and the integration of uh, time within special relativity theory. Um, now we're going to focus more on time specifically uh, in its own right. And in order to do that, um, we're going to uh, examine to start with, uh, one of the most famous philosophical arguments, uh, and certainly I think the most influential philosophical argument that's been advanced concerning the nature of metaphysics of time, um, uh, which is due to uh, McTaggart. Um, and we'll see that actually McTaggart's thinking and arguments, although generally they're rejected, have nevertheless helped to frame a lot of the debate on philosophy of time since because um, different people uh, disagree on which part of McTaggart's argument uh, ought to be rejected um, and, and that's come to define a lot of interesting positions in time. So why focus specifically on time rather than just talking about space-time? Um, well, one one reason is that time seems to have some interesting features uh, that the spatial dimensions lack, right? So it's not just another... seems like it's not just another dimension, right? So uh, a dimension that happens to be labelled T in Minkowski space-time diagrams. Um, it seems to have sort of rather different features uh, from, from the, the, the three spatial dimensions. So, um, specifically, uh, we normally think of time as directed. So, we think uh, that there's an asymmetry between past and future. We'll talk more about what that as asymmetry might amount to. Um, in, in the way in which there aren't uh sort of analogous spatial asymmetries so uh the the difference between i don't know up and down uh according to one spatial dimension um uh there's there's nothing doesn't seem to be anything really metaphysically fundamental about it um it's sort of arbitrary relative to a point of reference um you know such as the earth we might define up and down relative to our position on the earth um, uh, you know, it might be that there are differences um, between um, what lies above me um, to what lies below me, but that all looks very contingent, just to do with the contingent arrangement of matter, whereas you might think there's something more metaphysically fundamental about the difference between future and past, and we'll, that's something we'll come back to. Um, another difference is that uh, time at least to many people, seems or is uh, reasonably thought to have uh, a flow to it. So we often speak of the passage of time or the flow of time. 
you might hear an analogies drawn between uh, time and a river or something like that, which also seems to have a flow to it. Um, whereas there doesn't seem to be any obvious uh, analogous flow to the, the spatial dimensions. So it's a sort of bit weird to talk about the flow of space or something like that. So again, this suggests that there might be something metaphysically interesting, um, uh, maybe physically interesting, about the time dimension that just doesn't straightforwardly apply to three spatial dimensions. So uh, questions that have been asked by philosophers and that we'll touch upon are what accounts for the apparent asymmetry of time? What, if anything, accounts for that? What, if anything, accounts for the apparent flow of time? Or is the flow of time just something like an illusion? Um, what exists in time? So do only present things exist? Or uh, do future and past events and objects exist? And these are some of the questions we'll touch upon. But first, we'll focus on McTaggart. So McTaggart, um, I suppose, his argument um, is one that naturally has drawn a lot of attention um, and actually continues to despite the fact that it was published over a hundred years ago and uh, partly that's because of the very surprising conclusion that McTaggart draws. McTaggart argues that time is unreal. Um, now uh, that's weird. We'll see a bit more about what it means. Um, and as I say, most most people probably uh, have have rejected it, um, uh, but they they do so in interestingly different ways. So, um, McTaggart um, starts off by claiming uh, that events in time. Or moments in time. So you can think of a, a, a moment in time, um, I suppose, especially if you think time's absolute, it might be like a, a, a particular position in space uh, or a space time point or something. But a, a sort of, I suppose you might think about a moment in time as a sort of point among the, along the T dimension. Um, uh, this, uh, so, th so, so that's what a moment is. An, a, a, an event uh, is a sort of thing that might occupy a moment in time or might have parts that occupy moments in time. Um, so, for instance, regular events like a football match uh, might um, uh, occupy multiple moments of time, might be extended in time. Uh, maybe they have a, a part corresponding to each moment in time. Um, so... McTaggart claims that uh, events can be distinguished in in two different ways uh, as they uh, exist in time. So the first is that events can be distinguished according to what he calls their A properties. So A and B are just labels, um, not quite boring labels, but they're just the labels McTaggart gives to these things. They're arbitrary labels. Um, so the A properties, he says, are properties like being past, being present, being future, as well as more specific properties like being two days past, being 20 years future. So uh, we can distinguish events um, according to those properties. So uh, one difference between, uh, I suppose, uh, Henry VIII and uh, Prince William's great great grandchildren uh, is that uh, one lies in the past, whereas the other lies in the future, or something like that. Um, another way we can distinguish them is according to what he calls their B relations. Um, so, B relations are relations like is earlier than, is later than, is simultaneous with, is during, uh, and also more specific ones like is two days prior to, is uh, 30 years posterior to, um, and so on. So, for instance, uh, we as well as saying um, 
Henry VIII is uh, in the past, whereas William's great-great-grandchildren are in the future, um, we presumably uh, can say that Henry VIII is earlier than um, the... I, I, I mean, I guess the, these are objects. I should talk about their lives, maybe, as, because those would be things that were events. So the life of Henry VIII is is, it, is not only past, but it's earlier than um, the lives of uh, Prince William's great-great-grandchildren. Okay, so we have these two sort of ways of uh, distinguishing events in time, according to A properties and according to B relations. Now, McTaggart points out that B relations are permanent, right? So if one event is earlier than another, so for instance, the, the First World War is earlier than the Second World War, um, then it's always the case, excuse me, it's always the case uh, that um, uh, the first event is earlier than the second. So if the if it's true at one time that the First World War is earlier than the Second World War, then uh, it's always going to be the case that the First World War is earlier than the Second World War. Um, a property is different. Uh, they're impermanent. So something that was once future, you know, at a certain point of time, the, uh, the First World War was future, uh, then it became present, uh, and then it became past. So these A properties, unlike the B relations, seem to change. Okay. Now, McTaggart points out that uh, corresponding to the A properties and B relations of events, there are two ways in which we can order events in time or think about them being ordered in time. So we can think about them being ordered in terms of their A properties. So, for instance, how distantly past they are, whether they're present, how distantly future they are. Or we can think about them as being ordered according to their B relations. So, the idea is we'd order events in this series, um, which is called the B series as opposed to the A series, uh, according to whether uh, that event was earlier than or later than others and how far, how much earlier it was or later it was than others. Now, these sort of two ways of ordering um, are, are presumed to be equivalent, right? So um, I guess the most distant past uh events uh, come earlier than all the subsequent ones. So they, the, the, the A series is going to wind up um, uh, producing the same order as the, the, the B series, but it's just two ways of thinking about that order. Okay, so McTaggart's argument, McTaggart uh, draws upon this notion of the a series, that is the way of ordering events according to the A properties, and the B series, that is the way of ordering events in time according to their B relations, uh, in giving his argument that time in fact doesn't exist. So how does McTaggart's argument go? Um, well, it's laid out on the handout, um, and the first premise is that there can be no time without change. So McTaggart thinks that change is essential to time. We'll go into this premise uh, shortly and explain, uh, think about why one might believe premise one. Secondly, he argues that the A series or the A properties are necessary for change. Uh, so uh, they're essential if there's going to be change. He then says that the A series is contradictory um, and he draws from the, the premise three, the premise that the A series is contradictory, the intermediate conclusional lemma uh, that the A series doesn't exist. And, you know, that seems um, if premise three is true, then it seems that this intermediate conclusion that I've labelled lemma one must be true, right? So it doesn't seem that anything that's contradictory could exist. He then draws another intermediate conclusion, uh, which is that there's no change, right? So he said that the A series is necessary for change, which is uh, premise two, and he says that the A series doesn't exist. But if the A series doesn't exist... Um, and yet the A series is necessary for change, that it seems that there can't be any change. So that's the intermediate conclusion or lemma two and follows from 
uh, premise two and, and lemma one. And then the overall conclusion of the argument is that time doesn't exist. And this follows from lemma two, namely that there's no change, uh, together with premise one, which says that there can be no time without change. So premise one, there can't be time without change. Uh, we've inferred already that the, there is no change. So it seems to follow logically, deductively, that time doesn't exist. Now, it seems that this is a valid argument. Um, so by valid, uh, I mean in the, the narrow uh, philosopher's sense that if the premises are true, um, then the conclusion has to be true. So the conclusion deductively follows from the premises. Saying that an argument is valid doesn't imply anything in this sense about whether the premises are in fact true, and, and many people would argue that one or more of the premises is false. Uh, but if we grant the premises, it seems difficult to avoid the conclusion. Um, it seems that the argument's valid. So what's McTaggart's justification for the premises? Um, well, when it comes to premise one, there can't be any time without change. He thinks it's more or less self-evident. Um, so he thinks that um, a universe with nothing at all that changed uh, would be a timeless universe. Now, I suppose um, you could sort of um, try to get a grip on this, I suppose, by trying to imagine a universe where nothing changed. And you might sort of think, well, you could kind of imagine that. Um, see, you sort of, I suppose, if I try to do it at least, I sort of imagine um, myself staring out at a scene, maybe a vast scene of galaxies and so on, in which nothing changes, right? So uh, there's, 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 I don't observe anything to, to, to change at all. And, you know, maybe I'm... Uh, viewing this and getting increasingly bored because nothing's going on to interest me. Um, now, I might think, well, okay, yeah, so some time's elapsing, nothing's changing. That seems possible. But what's really going on there is I'm sort of supposing that my uh, mental states are changing. So, you know, I'm uh, looking out at this scene, thinking about it, getting increasingly bored. And so we at least still have some change in this universe. Um, but if I sort of try to imagine a genuinely changeless universe where n n no no physical object is changing, uh, no mental state of any observer or anything is changing, then then maybe this becomes increasingly hard. So this is the sort of motivation that McTaggart has for uh, premise one. Um, many people accept that there, there couldn't be time without change, um, but it's it's definitely not completely uncontroversial. So if you're interested in the debate about that premise, then uh, the uh, papers by Shoemaker and Le Poitevin on the further reading list for this topic, um, uh, the, the, uh, Shoemaker argues that the, um, uh, there can be, in fact, be time, time without change. And Le Poitevin is a, a response to Schumacher. But let's let's grant it for the sake of argument. Um, what about premise two? Uh, premise two is the A series is necessary for change. So McTaggart does provide a, uh, an extended justification for this. Uh, the justification is that the B relations are, as he's observed, permanent and unchanging. Um, so if World War One's earlier than World War Two, then it's always earlier than World War Two. There's no uh, point in time at which that temporal ordering reverses or something like that. So he thinks it's only the A properties that could change, right? So um, uh, it's the properties of pastness, presentness, futurity, uh, are the sorts of things that can change the A properties. <laughs> now you might think that you don't actually need the A properties uh, for change because you might think that regular properties can change. So you might say, well, look, uh, an apple 
could go from being green to being red to being brown as it ages. Um, so basically it's changing in its colour properties, um, not these fancy A properties of pastness, presentness, futurity. But the response that McTaggart would make to this uh, would be to say uh, that this uh, change in regular properties is in fact nothing more than a change in A properties. So in other words, what he'd say is that the green state of the apple goes from being present to past, the red state of the apple goes from being future to present to past, and the brown state of the apple goes from being future to present, um, and so on. So, uh, basically, in order to understand change in ordinary properties, he will think, or he will claim that we have to appeal to A properties. So, um, what makes an object change in its ordinary properties is that the state of its exhibiting uh, those ordinary properties changes from whether it's past, present, uh, or future. Okay, so this premise that the A properties are necessary for change is definitely controversial, um, in spite of what McTaggart says. Um, and what we'll see is that it's rejected by a, a sort of school or tradition of philosophers of time uh, who have become known as B-theorists, right? B-theorists normally agree with McTaggart that the A-series doesn't exist or it's problematic, um, but they reject McTaggart's conclusion that time doesn't exist, and that's because they reject his premise that the A-series is necessary for change. They claim that, in fact, um, the B-series is, is, is sufficient on its own uh, for change in time. What about premise three? Um, so the A-series is contradictory. So... McTaggart, in order to justify this, says, well, the A properties of pastness, presentness, and futureness or futurity are incompatible, right? So nothing can be past, present, and future. But to suppose that the A series exists is to suppose that every event has all of them. Um, so, uh, the First World War has the property of being past, being present, and being future, uh, which is contradictory. Uh, so, uh, supposing that events have A properties um, and stand in the A series because it implies that these events have all of the A properties, uh, results in a contradiction, so... Uh, anything that can't result, anything that results in a contradiction can't be true, so there can't really be a properties in an A series. Um, uh, and given that these a properties are necessary for change and change is necessary for time, he thinks that time is unreal. Okay, um, I should caveat that, right? So I suppose if there's a first or last moment in time. Uh, there may be s sort of events that occur at the first moment of the universe only have the properties of being present and past um, and never have the property of being future, whereas events at the last moment of time have the properties of being future and present but never the property of being past. But it seems that any event in the A series has at least two of the three um, broad A properties. Now... You might think that, look, McTaggart's just made a mistake here, um, a basic mistake here, and um, <clears throat> uh, actually the A-series isn't contradictory at all, or at least he hasn't shown it to be. Um, uh, McTaggart an anticipates that the reader might think that he's made a mistake here, and uh, he talks about the natural objection that the reader might have. 
Right, so the, the natural objection to his claim that the A series is contradictory is to point out that it's just not true uh, that some any event has uh, two or more of the A properties um, at the same time, right? So what would be contradictory is for the First World War, say, to be past, present, and future at the same time, right? You can't have all those properties at once. Um, but, of course, no one wants to say, no one claims that they have all of these properties at once, right? So what it would be natural to say is that the First World War had the property of being future uh, prior to 1914. Uh, it had the property of being present uh, during the years 1914 to uh, 1918. And it has had the property of being passed subsequent to 1918. Um, so... There's no contradiction, right? It's perfectly coherent that something that was future should now be present and should be going to be past. That's the natural objection. Um, the contradiction would only be in supposing an event has all of these properties simultaneously. Now, <clears throat> McTaggart anticipates this and responds that actually the natural objection involves a vicious circle or a regress um, in that it presupposes the existence of time in order to explain the compatibility of the A properties. Um, so the idea is that uh, it, we need to presuppose uh, time um, if we're going to say that actually the f there's no contradiction because... Um, the First World War doesn't have the properties of past, present, and futureness at the same time. It's when we say at the same time that we presuppose the existence of time. And we might say in the past it was future and then present, um, and now it is, is past. But again, we're talking about past and what's true past and what's true now. So we're presupposing um, these A properties, he would say. We're presupposing uh, the property of being past when we explain uh, how it could be that the world war one was future and present. And we're presupposing the property of presentness when we say, well, it's now the case the the first world war was passed so he thinks we're off on, on something like a vicious circle or a vicious regress uh in having to presuppose time and therefore the a series in order to explain how the a series is not contradictory so mctaggart thinks that there's there's sort of no refuge from uh this uh, the, this apparent problem uh, with the A-series. Now, not everyone's convinced still. So, um, in particular, um, theorists who are now known as A-theorists uh, reject McTaggart's premise three. Uh, they reject the idea that uh, the A-series involves a contradiction um, and uh, hence they uh, reject McTaggart's argument uh, that time is unreal. So atheists normally believe that, well, they do believe that um, there are, are a properties um, and normally they would take those a properties to be necessary for change and therefore time. Now, Okay, so how do they resist McTaggart's response to the natural objection? Um, so how do they resist this claim that uh, we're, we, when we try and explain the coherence of the A properties, we have to fall back on appeal to time itself or the A properties themselves. Uh, and so we're off on a, 
a vicious circle or a vicious regress or something similar. Well, <clears throat> the natural, uh, a reasonable response uh, that they might appeal to is to say something like the A properties in the A series are something like basic or primitive and can't be explained in terms of or reduced to anything else. So they might say it's just a brute fact that it's consistent for an event to be present, to be going to be past and to be to have been future. And you can't explain this uh, consistency in other terms. So this seems a kind of a reasonable point. So if you're going to take the A properties to be basic, um, then it, it, it's quite natural to think that you're not going to be able to explain them uh, without appealing to those very properties themselves. So in other words, explain them in other terms. Um, for instance, I mean, by analogy, suppose that um, uh, we take space to be basic. It's going to be very difficult to explain what space is without appealing to that that very notion. And the same applies to um, things like causation and other philosophically interesting notions. So um, some people think these can be reduced to other things, but many people think that they're somehow irreducible. And so the best they can do in giving an account of these things is giving a, a non-reductive account. Um, so they might explain some causal relations in terms of other causal relations or something like that. But you can never get away from that concept of causation if you're a if you think that that's a, a basic notion. So there's there's a sort of uh, a, a, a there's a position position you can take, namely that these are primitive that doesn't make it that surprising that you can't explain these in other terms um, and the fact that you can't explain them in other terms um, doesn't necessarily mean that a uh, notion is incoherent as McTaggart seems to be claiming uh, but just that it's basic right you can't define it away in, in terms of something else okay but let's return to for now to McTaggart's argument. Um, so he thinks obviously that uh, change is needed for time. The A series is needed for change. The A series is incoherent, so the A series doesn't exist. Therefore, there's no change. Therefore, there's no time. Now, actually, um, because McTaggart thinks that the A series doesn't exist. He also thinks that the B series doesn't exist either. So why is that? Um, obviously, this is going to be a, a claim that's rejected by B theorists who themselves uh, believe in the existence of the B series but normally reject the A series. McTaggart's claim is that... Um, we need the A series to make sense of the distinction between earlier than and later than. Um, so this is the, the B relations. Uh, so for instance, it's only by supposing that E is present but F is past, or E is future but F is present, or E is future but F is past, and so on, uh, that we can make sense of E being later than F. Um, and likewise for um, F's being earlier than E. So he thinks it's only in terms of uh, they're having different properties of pastness and presentness that we can make sense, uh, or future, futurity, that we can make sense of the uh, notions of earlier than and later than. But, as I say, the B theorist will contest this, and we'll come back to that. Okay, now... What does McTaggart exactly... So McTaggart's concluded that time is unreal, uh, but it, it's worth being sort of a bit careful about exactly what he means by that. Um, what he takes his argument to show, in other words, and what he doesn't take it to show. So what he doesn't take it to show is that there's no fourth dimension, right? So nothing that we could label 
T, I suppose, in a space-time diagram. Um, what he does take it to show is that this fourth dimension doesn't have the characteristics that would make it something that we could, um, could properly call a temporal dimension. So it's kind of more analogous to a, a spatial dimension, if anything, um, rather than a distinctively temporal dimension. Um, and that's because there's a lack of change. Um, so there's no real passage or maybe direction of time. Um, so McTag McTaggart does indeed seem to think that there is a fourth dimension, so he calls this the C-series. So essentially that's what's left of the B-series when we do away with the distinctions of past and future, right? So once we get rid of the A-series, this undermines the B-series, but there's some sort of residue left of the B-series. Um, so the C-series... Um, Basically, it has a, there's an order to it, uh, but there's no kind of direction, right? There's no past-future distinction, and therefore no earlier than, later than distinction. So, for instance, uh, the the natural numbers one, two, three, and so on um, have an order, um, but there's no real privileged direction um, in which they're ordered. I'll explain this in a second. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, so consider, um, so we might we might try to make sense of this ordering in terms of a betweenness relation uh, when it comes to to this C series or this this fourth dimension. So, one thing we could say is we could appeal to the uh, notion of betweenness that doesn't suppose an earlier than or later than uh, distinction. Um, for instance. Um, one might say that World War Two was between uh, World War One and the Vietnam War in this fourth dimension, um, just as we can appeal to between us when distinguishing points in space. So we could say something like um, uh, London is uh, between... Uh, Paris and Edinburgh. I mean, that might not be exactly true, but um, uh, we we could do that um, in a more precise way. Um, so, so the the analogy is supposed to be that we could we could appeal to between us. So, World War One is sorry, World War Two is between World War One and the Vietnam War. Um, and also, for instance, World War One is between the American Civil War and uh, World War Two, and this this uh, doing this sort of thing gives us an ordering. So we have uh, the ordering could be American Civil War, World War One, World War Two, Vietnam War. So in this ordering, uh, World War One and World War Two lie between the American Civil War and the Vietnam War. World War One lies between. Uh, World War Two and the American Civil War, and World War Two lies between World War One and the Vietnam War. But notice that we don't have an asymmetry here, uh, in the sense of a sort of privileged earlier than and later than distinction. So there's nothing to privilege this uh, this ordering: American Civil War, World War One, World War Two, Vietnam War over the one that sort of goes in reverse, Vietnam War, World War Two, World War One, American Civil War. Right. So just as when we appeal to between us to order uh Edinburgh, London and Paris, there's nothing privileged to an ordering that says uh, an ordering that says something like uh, Paris, London, Edinburgh, from one that says Edinburgh, London, Paris. There's no sort of sense in which um, Edinburgh is prior to Paris, objectively, or Paris is prior to Edinburgh. Um, all, all we have is is this sort of symmetric ordering. Um, uh, 
And, and so the claim would be that it that this goes to the, the, the fourth dimension too. Okay. So McTaggart still, I think, has a bit of explaining to do. So even if we accept all of this, uh, we might say, well, look, um, we experience the passage of time. We experience change. Um, so how does he account for that if there is no change and if uh, there is no time? Um, now, McTaggart's basically going to argue that uh, time and change, the passage of time and change, are, are in fact illusory. Um, so he does this by arguing that our impressions of time actually just couldn't correspond to anything objective. So they mu there must be something wrong with them. They must be illusory. So specifically, he appeals to the fact uh, or the notion of the experiential present. Um, that is the set of all things that are experienced by an individual as being present. Now, it's well known from psychological experimentation, um, and I guess even was reasonably well known in McTaggart's time, that the experiential present isn't an instant, but rather an interval. So, for instance, you can do psychological experiments where a sound or two sounds are emitted from uh, the uh, same, at the same distance from an agent, um, and they're not absolutely simultaneous, uh, but rather one is emitted slightly before the other. And nevertheless, the agents will experience them as being simultaneous um, so they're present at the same time um, there's even uh, experiments that show that in some cases you can actually get the uh, the agents experiences uh, of the sounds to be reversed from what we might want to say they objectively are in time so the earlier one is experienced as later and vice versa, and that's even though they're emitted at the same distance from the agent. Um, <clears throat> there's also uh, empir uh, empirical psychological evidence um, of time dilation or psychological time dilation and contraction, not to be confused with the, the special relativistic phenomenon. Um, basically, you can sort of uh, m most of us have had some sort of um, experience of this. So time seems to pass very slowly when you're bored, maybe. But it also seems to pass slowly when um, you're in danger. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but um, uh, somehow you sort of perceive a higher resolution or something when you're in danger. So it, it seems as though that uh uh time seems to you that, that time time slows down um you know and we've all all heard the sort of um sort of folk expressions like time flies when you're having fun uh, but there is actually sort of serious psychological research that, that that shows that we're we're subject to these temporal illusions now so McTaggart basically takes phenomena like this and says, look, what reason do we have to believe in a flow of time um, and uh, something like an objective present um, if there's just no systematic relation between this and the experiential present, what we experience as present, or the, the, the flow that we seem to experience. So he thinks that um, the only real reason we could have for believing in an objective present and an objective flow is because of our experience, uh, which seems to be of a present and a flow. Um, but actually... Uh, this experience couldn't represent anything objective, so there's no reason to believe it in 
the objective phenomenon. Now, of course, you sort of might um, try to resist McTaggart's argument. So you might think that, well, these psychological experiments actually sort of presuppose an objective, um, uh, an objective present, an objective flow of time. So, for instance, in describing uh, the one involving the sounds, you know, I said, well, the sounds are emitted at the same time, uh, sorry, at different times, uh, one earlier than the other, uh, but are either experienced by the agent as simultaneous, uh, so as co-present, or uh, it's the case that the earlier ones um, experienced by the agent as later than the, the later one. Um, so in saying things like that, I'm kind of falling back upon um, the the sort of notions of presentness and pastness, um, or at least the, the B relations of earlier than and later than uh, that uh, uh, McTaggart uh, is trying to reject. Um, and uh, so in general, in explaining how people are subject to temporal illusions, uh, we're sort of falling back on the idea that there's an objective passage of time that they're somehow misrepresenting. So you might sort of um, uh, think that even this talk of illusions presupposes uh, an objective passage of time. So McTaggart can't escape that that easily. Okay. Um, in any case, so most philosophers, as I've suggested, think that there's something wrong with McTaggart's argument. So Hardly anyone wants to accept that time isn't real, even in McTaggart's sense in which there's perhaps a fourth dimension, uh, but it just isn't distinctively a temporal dimension. Now, since we've seen McTaggart's argument appears to be valid, um, these philosophers have got to reject one of its premises, um, and philosophers are divided over which to reject. So, We've already seen that A theorists tend to reject or do reject uh, premise three. Uh, so they reject the idea that the A series is incoherent. Um, they accept the existence of A properties. And they think that events change with respect to these A properties. And that this change in A properties corresponds to the passage of time, which they take to be a real objective feature of the world that's not illusory. And normally uh, they'll take uh, the A properties to be primitive. You can't reduce them to anything else. And this, as I said, allows them to escape something like the, nat the natural objection that McTaggart, uh, sorry, McTaggart's response to the natural objection that it's circular. On the other hand, B theorists uh, reject the A series, but they think that... Uh, Actually, you don't need the A series to make sense of the B series. And they will normally think that the B properties alone are enough for change and therefore time. Uh, so they reject premise two of McTaggart's arguments. Um, so, uh, so some of them also reject premise one. So they actually don't think you need um, change, genuine change for time. Um Yeah, so so B theorists. So I suppose one question is, how do you make sense of the relationships of earlier than and later than if you don't have the A properties? Um, so uh, A is earlier than B if, for instance, A is in the past and B is in the future, where uh, as um, A is later than B if for instance, A is in the future and B is in the past. So how, how could we make sense of later than and earlier than if we don't avail ourselves in that way of uh, the distinctions of past, uh, presentness and futureness, the, the A properties, in other words? Well, I mean, basically, the sort of strategy that's often appealed to is a strategy that um, gives a notion in which the temporal dimension is asymmetric but doesn't rely on uh, the A-series to give that asymmetry. So um, one of the most well-known 
accounts of the uh, direction of time or the, the asymmetry of time appeals to a notion of entropy increase um, the, associated with the second law of thermodynamics. So the idea is, so entropy is a measure of, roughly speaking, a measure of disorder. Uh, if you're interested in this, by the way, you can look at the, um, I think it's the second last topic on Moodle. Um, the, there's some readings on the direction of time, or it might be the last, I think it's the last topic actually. Uh, but you'll be able to find them fairly straightforwardly, readings on, on the direction of time. Um, now, uh, Okay, so if you believe in this sort of reduction of the direction of time to uh, entropy increase, um, or in other words, disorder increase, then you can just say that, well, the earlier times are the ones where uh, disorder is lower or entropy is lower, and the later times are the one where entropy is higher or disorder is higher um, and so you can make sense of earlier than later than without actually having to invoke pastness presentness and futureness so that that's a sort of thing that the move that the b theorist is liable to make we'll, we'll talk more about this when we uh talk about time travel because that's our next topic um okay anyhow so so that's the the sort of b theorist approach now, the, the, although they reject um, the idea that there are kind of A properties of pastness, presentness, and futureness, they still want to kind of make sense of our usual ways of speaking. So our usual ways of speaking invoke things like, you know, we talk about the past or we talk in tensed ways, as, uh, you know, we said... Um, World War happened. We don't say it's happening. Um, uh, or we say that um, we will go to the supermarket tomorrow. Again, a, a future tense statement. So they want to make sense of this sort of apparent talk as though there are A properties without actually invoking A properties. And so actually what they'll do is they'll try and reduce this talk to B relations. So this is this point here on the handout. Um, so they take the um the this sort of talk to be a kind of indexical talk so it's analogous to spatial expressions like here or one mile away so whether it's true that uh bloomsbury is here uh when someone says that depends upon the person's relation to Bloomsbury at the time of utterance and um, what, whether it's true uh, when someone says the BT Tower is one mile away, um, it depends upon the location of the speaker at the time of utterance again. So the B theorist's idea is that analogously, a statement like World War Two is past um, actually um, uh, is sensitive to the location in the B series uh, that the speaker occupies or uh, 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 that the uh, speaker's utterance of the of the the sentence. Uh, occupies so uh, when they say world war ii is past that's going to be true if world war ii uh, bears the earlier than relation uh, that is a b relation uh, to their utterance of the sentence world war ii is past and likewise when i say that 2021 is future uh, then, according to the B theorist, that's going to be true because my utterance of that sentence bears the relation, the B relation of being earlier than to the year 2021. So, you could say they offer a reduction of um, uh, tense to B relations, or they offer a reduction of 
talk about a properties uh, to be relation. So they want to make sense of our talk without saying literally there are a properties. Okay, so what? Um, okay, so the, that's the A theorem, the B theory outlined. But um, what do we think about them? So uh, which is preferable if either? So A theorists will normally argue that their theory does a better job of accounting for the passage of time or for change. Um, they'll argue kind of in a McTaggartian way um, that um, really the B series doesn't provide enough for time um, because the the B relations are permanent. So uh, then they're unchanging. So um, just because one state of the world is earlier than another state of the world doesn't really give a sense in which... Uh, the first state of the world changes into the second state of the world because it's just this is just a permanent relation of earlier than. Uh, whereas if we say that the 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 earlier state uh, goes from being present to past, or future to present to past, then this provides a genuine sense in which there's change in the world. So uh, you consider the uh, the apple example that we used earlier. So. Uh, its green state is earlier than its red state is earlier than its brown state, but this doesn't really provide a sense of change, uh, at least the atheist will say so, uh, because it's always the case that the brown state is, uh, oh, sorry, the, the green state is earlier than the red state is earlier than the brown state. Um, what we'd actually need in order for genuine change, they claim, is for the... Uh, the green states uh, to be present and then past, and for the, the red state to be future, then present, then past, and for the brown state to be future, then present, then past. Um, uh, and that will give us genuine change. So that's an objection. Um, the B theorists might... So that they'll they'll normally try to respond to this. Um, they 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 might say such things as, well, the we talk about rivers changing um, over their course. Um, now, maybe a river is a bad example because there is a sense in which a river flows, but. Uh, like time flows, that's an analogy that's used, but um, um, uh, it is only an analogy. Um, but we might say, for instance, that the river changes from being narrow to wide. Um, so it might be narrow near its source and wide at its mouth. Um, and yet... We don't need to appeal to uh, anything analogous to uh, an A property in order to um, make sense of what it is for the river to change over its course. It's changing over its course is just a matter of its having one property at one point on its course, namely narrowness, and another point um, at another point of its course, namely wideness. And likewise, the B theorist might say, uh, well, what it is for, um, for instance, the apple to change is just for it to have uh, one property, the property of greenness, at an earlier point um, than its property of, of redness. So uh, they'll say that's, that, that's just what change is, just like change for the river. Um, whereas the the a theorist will say, well, you know, this isn't enough for real change, right? The 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 river isn't isn't really changing. It's just in a sort of figurative sense that it changes it changes, um, and they'll say that the the b theorist has only really provided a figurative sense in which the apple changes. But there, I mean, there are objections to the a theory too. So one might. 
wonder about whether you can really make sense of the passage of time, right? So according to the uh, A-theorist, time genuinely passes, and that's marked by the transition of events from uh, future to present to past. But can we really make sense of the, the notion of time passing? So one might say, well, if time passes, then it surely fo follows logically that there's a rate at which it passes. But then, is it really coherent to speak of a rate at which time passes, right? What would we say? It passes at one hour an hour, second a second. Um, this doesn't really seem to make clear sense, or it doesn't really sort of seem to be meaningfully meaningful talk. Um, now, if you were genuinely to make sense of the the rate of at which time passes, you might need an external reference point, uh, maybe a second stream of time with which to measure the first stream of time. Um, <clears throat> just like if you wanted to measure uh, the amount of time it takes for a clock to register a change of a minute, it seems that you need a second clock. Um, and well, you might be sceptical that there's a, uh, uh, a second uh, stream of time um, to make sense of the notion of passage in the first stream of time. Another um, objection um, to the A theory, and this is one it's worth maybe if you're interested, especially if you're thinking of writing an essay on this topic, it's also worth taking a look at the readings uh, for next week's topic and the handout that I've put on Moodle there it is, be is because there's sort of an objection of to the A theory from the special theory of relativity. So the problem for the A theorist is that um, the present so they, they believe there's such a thing as a present. Um, and the, pr the objective present is supposed to correspond to a set of points in space-time that are all simultaneous, right? What else could we mean by the, pr the objective present if it's not a point, uh, a set of points in space-time that are simultaneous? Um, but the trouble is that in, as we've seen in uh, special relativity, Minkowski space time, um, really there's no uh, unanimity on simultaneity. So, in particular, simultaneity is relative to a choice of reference frame, um, which corresponds to a position and a velocity. Um, or, or a velocity of um, uh, an observer. Um, so, okay, I think we can just you know we 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 can we can get a grip on the notion of uh, simultaneity being reference frame relative, but does it really make sense to talk about presentness being reference frame relative? Certainly, it seems that the uh, a theorist um, might have to concede that in light of the special theory of relativity. Um, so, so the, I mean, the sort of problem is that um, it, it it kind of now looks perspectival exactly what's present, what's past, and what's future. It looks relative relativized to a reference frame. And you might wonder whether this can be sort of reconciled with the view that there are kind of fundamental facts about what's present, past, and future. Um, next week's handout contains some more elaboration, or, or the next topic's handout, I should say, uh, uh, about this issue, so it's worth a read. Okay, so the A theory and the B theory, which we've looked at, so far um, can be thought of as different theories of the nature of time. There's also a, a, an interestingly different, in some senses, related debate 
um, in metaphysics about what exists in time. Um, and the main positions there are known as presentism, eternalism, and the growing universe theory. Um, now, presentism um, is the thesis that only temporally present objects, events, and times exist, right? So according to the presentist, uh, Aristotle doesn't exist, World War I doesn't exist, and uh, the year 2018 doesn't exist because these are all past objects, events, or times. Um, also, according to the presentist, my uh, grandchildren, um, the year 2020, the inauguration, sorry, I should say 2021, um, <laughs> or the inauguration of the 46th president of the United States don't exist. Um, uh, and that's because they're, they're future objects, events, or times. Um, so eternalism, by contrast, thinks that, or claims that uh, present and future objects, events, and times exist just as present objects, events, and times exist. So all of those things that I mentioned exist. So Aristotle exists. Uh, my grandchildren exists, uh, exist, uh, and presum presuming I will have some, um, and the inauguration of the 46th president of the United States exists, so that these things all exist just as present objects and events exist. So the eternalist um, conceives of reality as a kind of four-dimensional space-time structure sometimes referred to as the block universe. So you might think, actually, Minkowski space-time uh, representations lend themselves to a kind of eternalist picture, um, although it's not absolutely clear that we can really just read facts about what exists of some representation um, of space-time, right? So that that's actually a philosophical move. Uh, but you might think that sort of somehow eternalism naturally complements uh present physicalist thing uh, uh, uh sorry present uh thinking in physics about uh space and time we'll go into that in a moment the the growing universe theory is a third major theory um on what exists in in time and it's sort of a halfway house between presentism and eternalism so According to the growing universe theorist, uh, the past and present exist, uh, but the future doesn't exist. Uh, correspondingly, past and present objects and events exist, uh, but the future objects and events ex don't exist. So the Big Bang, Aristotle, and so on exist. Uh, this again should say the on the handout the year uh, 2021, my grandchildren and so on don't exist. Um, so the growing universe theorist again regards the universe as a uh, four-dimensional space-time structure, but it, it's sort of, to speak a bit figuratively, it's not as big as the one that the eternalist believes in, um, uh, because it doesn't include the future. So it's a, a, a structure that increases in size uh, as more things come into existence. In other words, as time passes, so more stuff is in the past. So why would you be a growing universe theorist? Well, um, one or probably the main motivation is uh, that we sort of have an intuition that the past is settled while the future is open. So the growing universe theorist accommodates this intuition by saying that the past is settled in the sense that it exists, whereas the future is open in the sense that it doesn't yet exist. Okay, so let's go into a bit more the sort of motivation and the evaluation of these various positions about what exists in time. So 
Um, now you might say, well, look, uh, eternalism sounds very weird, um, and to some extent the grand universe theorist does, because it just says sounds very weird to say things like uh, dinosaurs exist. Um, that applies. The grown universe theorist has to say that just as well as the eternalist because they're committed to the existence of past objects. Um, <clears throat> note that saying dinosaurs exist is equivalent to saying there are some dinosaurs. Now that's weird, right? It's weird to say that there are some dinosaurs. If someone said it to you, I think you'd probably think what they said was false um, and maybe a bit crazy. Um, uh, likewise, the eternalist seems committed to saying that uh, my grandchildren exist um, or there are some people who are my grandchildren, which is, is logically equivalent. Um, and yet, I deny <laughs> that I have grandchildren. Um, so, these seem to be weird and counterintuitive consequences. Now, <clears throat> the eternalist and the growing universe theorist fortunately have responses uh, to to this um, and they they argue that the apparent oddity of these claims have to do with what's known as quantifier restriction um, domain restriction some of you that those of you who've done first order logic uh, will have hopefully come across this so the analogy that they might give uh, is as follows suppose that I'm driving around a full car park. Um, been driving around for 10 minutes. Uh, can't find a space anywhere. Uh, and my passenger says to me, there's a free parking space. Um, now, I'd be like, oh, like, all excited. Where's the free parking space? Um, and suppose they said, well, there's this car park... Uh, suppose I've been driving around a car park in London. They're like, well, there's a car park in Paris that's got a space free. Look, I just Googled it. Um, presumably, I'm not going to be very impressed by that statement, right? And in fact, their initial statement that there's a free parking space sounded quite wrong, even though there's a sense in which they're right that is somewhere in all of reality there's indeed a free parking space. So what's going on in this parking space example is that there's a variability in what's known as quantifier restriction. So the natural way of understanding my passenger's claim that there's a free parking space is a claim about things in this car park, right? So a claim that there's a free car, uh, parking space in this car park. Uh, in other words, their existential claim there exists a, or there is a, a free parking space is naturally understood by me or interpreted by me to be restricted to the, the domain of things in the car park. Uh, relative to that restricted domain, their, their claim is false. However, relative to an entirely unrestricted domain, the domain of all things that exist in reality and not just this car park, their claim's true. So the eternalist and the growing universe theorist are, are going to make an analogous appeal to quantifier restriction. And they'll say that the, the claim that there are dinosaurs, or there are some dinosaurs, um, and likewise, uh, more generally, claims that there exist past objects and events, and in the case of the eternalist, that there are future objects and events, um, are true relative to a totally unrestricted domain of quantification. So when I say there are dinosaurs, that's true relative to a completely unrestricted domain. But the reason it sounds odd is because normally uh, someone who hears me say that 
will interpret me as making a claim about more some some more restricted domain. Um, for instance, uh, the domain of objects that exist in the present rather than throughout all of reality. So, in other words, when I say there are dinosaurs or there are some dinosaurs. Um, I might be nat naturally interpreted as meaning uh, there are some dinosaurs that exist in the pre oh sorry there are some dinosaurs in the present uh, which of course is false, um, but um, they'll say all they mean is that um, th there are dinosaurs is true uh, relative to the most unrestricted domain. Um, in other words, what there is in all of reality. Okay, so the so that's a discussion about eternalism. Um, what about the growing universe theory? So we've seen one advantage is that they provide a sense in which the past is settled and the future is open, and often we think about the the universe in this way. Um, but the growing universe theorist has some problems too, and and actually um, one of them, or maybe the maybe the the key one, is very similar to an objection to the A theory, which is that um, so the A theory seems to want to account for the passage of time, or seems to imply there exists a passage of time, and then it makes sense if time genuinely passes, to ask what rate it passes at. But there seems to be no sensible answer to that question. Likewise, with the growing universe theorist, if the universe is growing, we might think it seems that it's sensible to ask uh, what rate it's growing at. But all the answers to that look kind of absurd, and um, so maybe makes a question absurd. Um, and given that the growing universe theorist seems to, or theory seems to suggest that that question's legitimate, maybe it casts doubt on the growing universe theory. So we might say, well, you know, what rate could the universe possibly be growing at? An hour per hour, a trillion objects an hour? Um, it seems, you know, the, those answers seems, seem weird. But moreover, there's another objection related, which is that, if the growing universe theorist um, is going to talk about the rate uh, of growth, then they're going to have to appeal to the passage of time. So they're going to have to say something like an hour per hour or a trillion objects per hour. Um, but that, I suppose, undermines one um, a seeming virtue of the growing universe theorist, which was that we might have hoped that it would provide an account of the passage of time in terms of the growth of the universe. So we might have hoped that, you know, if we're going to appeal to this notion of the growth of the universe, then maybe we can understand the passage of time in terms of the universe's growth. But this actually look might look circular if... if uh, um, if we then have to uh, appeal again to the passage of time in order to explain the rate of the universe's growth. So, so best, I mean, like, it, I suppose at worst, um, the problem is that if the universe is growing, then it should make sense for there to be a rate at which it's growing, um, and that it doesn't really make sense uh, because ants like an hour per hour or a trillion objects per hour aren't really sensical. Um, at best, the the objection is just that um, one advantage or, or apparent advantage to the growing universe theory, namely that it seemed able to provide an account of the passage of time, is actually undercut because we need an answer to this question. Um, what rate is it growing at? And in order to account for what rate it's growing at, we need to appeal uh, in a sort of circular manner to the passage of time. 
Okay, what about presentism? So <clears throat> I think uh, presentism maybe uh, has some sort of intuitive pull. Um, so, uh, you, you know, you might think that there's a, there's a sort of... A, beyond the point about uh, the weirdness of saying there are some dinosaurs um, and beyond the the uh, eternalist defense against that worry um, you might think there just is some intuitive sense in which the dinosaurs have gone out of existence right so they just don't exist anymore um, and you might think even more so there's maybe a an intuitive sense in which uh, my grandchildren don't exist. They don't. They don't exist yet, and um, and they're not part of reality, right? So, uh, so you might sort of want to sort of dig your heels in against the uh, the eternalist and say, look, you know, uh, they really are not part of reality, right? It might have been that they were part of reality, or they will be part of reality, but they're they're just not part of reality as it is. Um, so so that's that's part of the appeal but there are also worries about presentism um so there are a few um we'll go through three key ones so there's an objection about causation so consider the claim trump's election victory caused him to be u.s president that seems like a, a plausible claim um but the trouble is that um Trump's election victory was in the past. So according to the presentist, it doesn't exist. But you might say, well, how can an event that doesn't exist cause one that does? Namely, his present his currently being president. Um, it doesn't just it doesn't seem to make any sense to talk about events that don't exist causing ones that do. In a similar vein, there's a, an objection to do with language, an objection from reference. So, it seems that I can refer to non-present objects like Shakespeare. So, I might say Shakespeare is a playwright. Um, and I normally think I'm referring to somebody when I say Shakespeare is a playwright. Um, namely, Shakespeare. Um, but you might wonder how I can refer to objects that don't exist. Um, so this is sort of difficult. So you might think, well, you know, there's a sense in which I can refer to fictional objects that don't exist. Maybe unicorns, maybe Harry Potter, maybe Father Christmas. But the story about how I refer to them or in what sense I refer to them might be sort of complex um, and a bit controversial so it might might um, uh, we might think there are sort of fictional entities that you can refer to uh, we might think that you don't literally refer to an entity but you sort of um, uh, refer to some feature of a fiction um, now, okay, so you might be able to give some story about how you refer to sort of non-existent, some non-existent, namely fictional entities. But would we want to reduce uh, our account of how we refer to Shakespeare to uh, the same thing as how we refer to Father Christmas? It seems that there's a greater reality, we might say, to Shakespeare than Father Christmas. So maybe our story about reference should be the same and maybe that sort of pushes in um uh that, that sort of maybe pushes in the, the 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 direction of eternalism so you might think the, the way in which i refer to shakespeare is more like the way in which i refer to queen elizabeth the second than it is like the way i refer to father christmas now finally and again it it'll be worth for those interested, and particularly those writing on this topic, to uh, take a look at some of the details from next week on the extended handout um, and the reading, because there's a, a sort of objection from uh, the special theory of relativity, which again is developed in more detail in uh, the 
uh, next topic's reading. Um, and obviously kind of interesting in, in light of the themes of the course. And the, the issue is that it seems that there's a tension between presentism and the special theory of relativity in a way analogous to the sense in which there's a tension maybe between the A theory and the special theory of relativity. So the A theory, of course, says that there's a property of presentness, uh, an objective property, um, but what is it for uh, a set of points in space-time to be present? Um, well, it's... Uh, Presumably, at least they have to all be simultaneous. Um, and they also have this property of, of being present. Now, the, the trouble was that simultaneity is relative to a reference frame. And so, in other words, a velocity, according to the special theory of relativity. Um, so it becomes difficult to make sense of uh, an absolute notion of presentness. Now, this problem is potentially even deeper uh, for the presentist than it is for the uh, atheist. And the reason is that the presentist thinks that what's present is what's real, um, whereas the atheist doesn't necessarily have to deny uh, that non-present objects exist but merely say that pr present objects have a special property of presentness. Um, but if you say that what's real, what exists, is what's present, and yet what's present is relative to a velocity, then does that mean that we have to say that what's real is relative to a velocity? Now, that's quite peculiar um, and would give a sense in which maybe what's real for me um, traveling at one velocity is different from what's real for you uh, traveling at a different velocity. Um, and we might really wonder about the coherence of this notion of reality for me or reality for you. Um, in any case, there's certainly a challenge um, for the the presentist in trying to give a coherent uh, picture of what it is they're claiming is real uh, that's compatible uh, with uh, the relativity of simultaneity and therefore relativity of presentness uh, that... Um, the special theory of relativity seems to imply. Um, so as I say, if you'd like more details on that, then it's well worth taking a look at some of next week's readings and also the handout for that. Okay, uh, but we will leave it there. Um, and I'm sorry this hasn't been as um, enjoyable as a, uh, uh, hopefully a seminar would be, um, because, for instance, it hasn't allowed for... Q&A um, uh, or any sort of discussion um, but hopefully you've got something out of it um, and uh, as I say between between the, the, the handout my discussion um, and the, the the readings that are on Moodle uh, you'll be in pretty good shape if you've if you've read through all of those Okay, thank you, and uh, I will produce another one of these uh, for the next week's topic. Um, so have fun and uh, stay healthy.